Hello, everyone tuning in to the staff workshop for the informal draft of the small MS4 permit. Um, I'm Paul Levy with the State Water Board. Um, before I get into the presentation, I'm just going to acknowledge that the State Water Board's mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations. Uh, we acknowledge every human being has the right to safe, clean, affordable, and accessible water. And uh, in this regard, working with the California Native American tribes holds a special value at the Water Board. We value integrating tribal input as well as input from groups who experience economic, environmental, and social disadvantages, and want to use as much of that input as we can to enhance Water Board activities and policies. So, um, as I said, I'm Paul Levy with the State Water Board. I'm part of the Municipal Stormwater Permitting uh, Unit. So we actually cover both the small MS4 permit, which is what we're talking about at the workshop today, as well as the Caltrans statewide uh, stormwater permit. Um, there are five staff and our supervisor, Mary Boyd, uh, which you can see in this slide. And you'll be hearing from you know a few of us on the presentation today and then in the questions and answers afterwards. And uh, I assure you that all, everyone you don't hear from is working behind the scenes, making sure this program goes smoothly. So uh, just an explanation of what today's meeting is. It's an informal discussion. Uh, there's, there's no official written responses or formal action that's gonna be taken during or based on this meeting. Uh, basically, we just wanna get your informal feedback on this uh, version of the permit that we put out and use that to inform future drafts, which eventually will be a more formal uh, public comment process uh, with the formal written comments and the cataloging and uh, of all the all and releasing all the comments we receive. But that's not what this this step is. Um, so at the meeting today, uh, we're going to answer questions as time allows. After we finish our presentation, we'll take a short break. Um, we'll have up the email that you can send your questions to, and then when we come back, we'll kind of try to go through as many as we can. Uh, also, if you're not already signed up. Um, you should sign up for our email list uh, through Gov Delivery. If you go to the Small MS4 webpage on the State Water Board website, the, the link's in the top right corner of our webpage. And that has more directions on it. Um, so if there's any technical issues today, um, I don't know if anyone sh should really need assistance because we're not admitting anyone to the Zoom, but if there's any uh, audio or video issues with the webcast that you want to uh, inform us about. Uh, I mean, we are keeping an eye on it, but um, you can email those to smallms4workshop at waterboards.ca.gov with the subject line technical assistance, and then just let us know what the issue is and we'll uh, do our best to take care of it. And then you can use that same email address, smallms4workshop at waterboards.ca.gov to submit any questions you have about the informal draft or about the phase two permit that you want us to try and answer at the end. So when you submit those questions uh, in the subject line, we're asking that you put the category or the kind of topic that your question is about. So for example, you know, as we go through each slide, about something on that slide or a specific section of the permit, you could, you could put that in the subject line. Um, and then please put your name, the organization you're with, and then you know, uh, your question or multiple questions. But another thing is we do ask if you have questions about multiple topics, please send those in different emails with different subject lines. Um, hoping that just having one subject per email will help us just go through them in a more orderly fashion at the end of the meeting. So you can you can submit one email with two questions or multiple questions on a single topic. But if you want to ask about three different topics, then maybe send three different emails. And I that, that would help us a lot. So this is kind of a agenda of what we're going to go over at the meeting today. First, I'm going to do an overview of the permit, and then I'm going to kind of go through each section and just discuss the major changes. Um, I can't really get into every single detail that, that's been changed, but I'm going to try and highlight what I think are the, the big ones. Then I'm going to sort of give a, just a little overview of the total maximum daily loads, the TMDLs. Um, those are kind of unique to each site or each permittee. So 
I'm not going to get too much into each individual one. Um, then I'll discuss this alternative compliance option that we're uh, proposing, uh, which could you know help meet some of these TMDLs potentially. Then I'm going to pass it off to Nick, who's going to discuss the trash requirements. Then Flora is going to discuss uh, ASBS, which is areas of special biological significance. Then we'll take a 15 minute break. Then when we come back, we'll uh, go to the Q&A session. So very high level, just history of the phase two small MS4 permit. First version of it came out in 2003. Um, that was reissued in 2013. And um, that's still the, the version of the permit that's in effect right now, the 2013 one. So it's been administratively extended for several years. Um, there was a kind of like large, relatively big amendment to it in 2017 to add some TMDL requirements. Um, that's still the existing effective permit. And we're anticipating that, you know, this informal draft will move forward through some different, more formal phases. And hopefully we'll get this reissuance out next year in 2025. So just to kind of touch on like the high level reorganization of the permit, um, on the left and right here are just the list of the documents that make up the 2013 the existing permit and the informal draft, this one new one we're discussing. And um, you can see there's still the same number of documents, but there has been some shuffling around of what's in each one. So I'm just going to touch on that. So the sort of the base of the permit, what we're calling the order, um, a lot of that has moved over into what we're still calling the order, but um, a few parts of it have been broken out into their own attachments. So the the basically application, the NOI, and then the, the waiver requirements, those are now attachment C, and provisions for traditional and non-traditional permittees are attachments D and E, respectively. And so... Part of the point of that was just to make it easier if you're a, a traditional permittee you and you don't, depending on if you are in an ASBS or a team deal, you might just need that one requirement and then you don't even have to mess with the rest of the documents most of the time. You know, we're just trying to make it easier to navigate the whole thing, uh, maybe to kind of cut down the size of some of the documents so that there's not these big unwieldy documents that you have to wade through. Um, and so that's kind of the intention of that. Uh, uh, the fact sheet is now going to be labeled as attachment B. That's actually not included in this informal draft. We didn't have a full fact sheet to release with this. Attachment G is still the TMDL attachment that maintains the same lettering. Attachments A and B in the existing permit are the lists of permittees. We've just made that into one attachment, but then within the attachment, there are multiple lists. Um, so now anyone interested in kind of the whole universe of permittees can just go to one place, one document, but it's still really easy to, to break it down and to find the list of traditionals versus the list of non-traditionals. Attachments C and D in the existing permit, which both deal with ASBS have been combined into attachment F. Attachment D was just kind of a, a list of the dischargers that it was applicable to. So now that's kind of just the, the lead of attachment F. And now all the ASBS stuff is in one spot. And then attach, attachments uh, H and I, acronyms, abbreviations, and glossary. Now all those kind of definitions and defined terms, those are all in one attachment, which is J. Uh, attachment E, which was titled Education and Outreach Requirements. It's actually pretty specifically the community-based social marketing requirements. Um, so that's only applicable to certain permittees, but it's also pretty similar in a lot of ways to the, the main or base level education requirements. So what we try to do is kind of condense what the differences were and make that a section which is in attachment D so it doesn't have to be its whole own attachment. So community-based social marketing requirements have moved into public education under attachment D now. And then attachment F, which was standard provisions, uh, those have been put in the base order. That kind of includes all the sort of base level legal 
things and provisions like that. Um, then we have in the in draft attachments H and I, those are both new for trash requirements and alternative compliance. So now at a little bit lower level into the permit, um, some of the reformatting and reorganizing we've done. Uh, the text on, on here is blurred because the it's a lot of information. And, and the point of the slide is just to show you um, the kind of structure of the requirements. So in the existing permit, there's this kind of task description, implementation level, and reporting subsections. And um, you know, sometimes like you can you can sort of see in the blurred text. Sometimes there's this uh, large paragraphs of text. Sometimes they have a list in there. Sometimes there's might be multiple requirements within one paragraph. Um, and even in this task description, sometimes that's sort of like a high level overview or summary that doesn't have any substantive requirements, but sometimes it does. So we just sort of try to do away with that uh, organizing it that way and tried to really break everything out and number each individual requirement kind of as much as we can. So it's easy to reference the specific, you know, action or part of the permit you're talking about. And then definitely if there's like a list of, of anything of, uh, we've tried to break that out into a numbered list so that it's just easier to read and, um, actually see the whole like universe that the requirement, you know, what it's asking you to do. So we do have a couple of new permittees. There's two new traditional permittees, which are Willits and San Benito County. And then additionally, we've named 37 state parks, which weren't named in the existing permit. Those aren't really new permittees exactly. State parks actually operates as more like a single permittee. And then they, all their state parks are kind of like sub areas, or sub units of that one permittee. Um, then we've also listed some new designated places, census designated places or CDPs, which are areas that need to be covered by county permittees. And similar to state parks, the census designated places, they they aren't their own, you know, separate entities. They're just they're areas that aren't, they don't have a governing body. So they're really not permittees themselves. And to kind of try to make that clearer, um, in the list of permittees, we've broken out state parks and census designated places. So that when you look at the list of traditional permittees, um, basically every line in that list is a permittee. There's no census designated places, which are actually like sub areas of another permittee. And the same for state parks. There's now one line that says state parks, um, you know, and it's like a statewide permittee under the non-traditional list. But then the list of state parks is broken out separately into a different table. So, um, now I'm going to go one by one through the six minimum control measures. Those are kind of like the most basic pillars of the phase two program that are set out like in the federal law of minimum things we have to include. Um, and it's makes up like most of the base level requirements of the permit. So those are public education and outreach, public involvement and participation, illicit discharge detection and elimination, pollution prevention and good housekeeping, construction runoff control and post-construction. So the first two, public education outreach and public involvement and participation, um, we've decided to kind of combine those into one section. One, because involvement and participation was a pretty small section that only had a very few requirements. And two, because they're just kind of related to each other. Um, there's sort of like a spectrum of outreach to involvement and participation. And it just seemed like it made sense to just put them all as one and not have this tiny section for involvement and participation. Um, another kind of change here is that there were some sections on staff training that were under public education. Uh, it seemed like that would made more sense to move to their respective sections. So now there's an illicit discharge staff training section and a pollution prevention staff training section, since that's really dealing with staff and not not so much the public. Um, then in, as I described earlier, how we try to kind of list everything out, now all the topics that you have to cover in your public education, try to make like a pretty clear list of what all those topics are. Um, 
and specifically one new one is uh, has to do with pet waste management. Um, and there's kind of a little bit broader of a pet waste management requirements in the permit, kind of discuss a little more about that uh, later. And actually, you know, I'll, I'll explain the pet waste public education when I get to that part too. Uh, in the illicit discharge uh, detection and elimination section, uh, just going in kind of the order, one of the first things at the beginning is there used to be two separate uh, sections discussing a spill response plan and an illicit discharge response plan. We've kind of combined those into one. You don't necessarily have to change your plans or combine them into one, but similar to the public education and, and outreach and involvement, it was like seemed like there was a spectrum from spill to illicit discharge response. And, you know, maybe at first you think it's an illicit discharge you're responding to, but then that kind of, you realize it's elevating into a spill. So as we we're just reorganizing the permit, it seemed like it made sense to kind of put those together. Um, you know, your existing plan could potentially still meet what's in there without necessarily reprinting it as a combined plan. I, um, so it was mostly an organizational change, I think, to combine those. Another thing we tried to clean up was uh, when you have to take dry weather flow samples. That was a question we got sometimes. Um, the existing permit almost seems like it suggests, you know, anytime you see a dry weather flow that's, you know, a certain number of hours past the last storm event, you have to sample it. But the clarification we're trying to make is that that's only if you can't identify what it is and stop the dry weather flow if it's you know, something that's not allowed. So, you know, if you can clearly identify what the, you know, the dry weather flow is, then you don't have to sample it and check it against this table. Um, then probably the biggest uh, change in this section is a new requirement for industrial and commercial inspections. Um, so in the existing permit, uh, there's already a list of potential illicit discharge sources that includes a lot of different types of industrial and commercial facilities in the draft that what we asked for in the list has been expanded a little bit. And then we're asking you to actually go out and and kind of check on these and see if they're implementing, you know, proper stormwater practices, like not cleaning things out into the gutter, not storing, you know, things uncovered outside that are going to get into the storm drain. Um, so the existing permit kind of has something almost like this, where you have to look at these priority areas at kind of a higher scale. Um, it was kind of unclear exactly how it was getting interpreted everywhere and what was being done on that, you know, in the on the proactive side of this illicit discharge prevention. And um, so that's why we're kind of asking for these inspections. Um, you know, I worked with the regional boards putting this together. So they see both phase ones and phase twos. I know phase ones and twos are different and they're different sizes and have different resources, but I think they've just seen a lot of prevented discharges from these inspections with their phase ones. Um, and they've also seen instances where the phase ones are able to kind of coordinate these inspections with existing inspections like oils and grease and health inspections and other kind of existing programs going on. So, you know, they're think thinking it's not necessarily a whole new thing that just stormwater staff are going to do. Um, and I know we've already kind of got some comments on this in preliminary drafts, so we do want to hear, you know, more about the feasibility of this or um, what sort of version of something like this might be implementable. Um, but right now, um, what we're proposing is once this inspection starts, uh, you know, a couple years into the permit that there will be a 20% of the list of facilities will be visited annually so that once per five years, you would have visited each facility. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if, uh, if basically there's any observation of evidence of illicit discharges or not improper practices that those would kind of follow the existing, um, you know, uh, procedures in your permit for uh, dealing with those. Uh, in the pollution prevention and good housekeeping section, 
Uh, probably the biggest change here is sort of new and also rearranging some existing things into asset management. So in the existing permit, there are several different inventories you have to have of different elements of your stormwater system. So that included the outfalls. You definitely had to go out at some point and do an inventory of all your outfalls. Uh, the existing permit asks for an inventory of all your catchments or catch basins and prioritizing those for, for clean out every year. Um, the existing permit also had some requirements about keeping an inventory and like a tabular database of your structural controls that are in place from the post-construction requirements. So we're kind of combining those all in one here and then adding on to it a little bit. So additionally, we're kind of just asking you to, to inventory more parts of your storm drain system, including the storm drain pipes themselves. Um, and I know we've gotten some comments on that already. Uh, we're not necessarily expecting a full on, you know, foot by foot inspection and super accurate GPS map of all your pipes. We've tried to write in some some sentences sort of allowing for estimates and grouping of things where you have, you know, you might be able to like group part of your system's pipes together and give an approximate number um, or kind of like an average age or something like that. And the level of detail uh, is something we've been asked about what level of detail we want. Cause we do, we do kind of have a list in there of all these different um, aspects of each item that you can include. And then I, but I think it comes down to what details actually necessary would be the level of detail you need for these next couple of steps. So the inventory will feed into a map um, and the map will be kind of like a base map of your whole system. It can be useful for like all kinds of different parts of the permit where you need to put something over a map. Um, and then you have to identify the level of service and do some longer term maintenance and improvement planning. So level of service is kind of like the effectiveness or just is this element of your system working or not? Is it keeping you in compliance with the requirements of this permit? And so kind of depending on the uh, the item, you know, that could either be a yes, no question, or it could be a, you know, what's the actual amount of pollution that this BMP is stopping? And it's left, I think, a little bit open because we know that the phase two permit applies to a broad range of sizes of permittees with different resources avail available. So I think while in some of these sections, we we list maybe all the things that we would want, uh, I think we try to leave it somewhat open to determine you know the detail you need to put in the level of service to kind of just know if your system is working or not. Um, and then similarly, level of detail of the inventory would be enough detail to kind of let you do this longer term maintenance planning that's required at the kind of final section of the asset management section. Um, another new thing in pollution prevention and good housekeeping is pet waste management. I mean, I guess usually dogs, but there's probably some other kind of pet that has waste that we didn't want to leave out. So this kind of came about because uh, one of the regions was working on some bacteria or pathogen TMDL requirements. And they had some things for dog waste that just seemed so broadly applicable to and good practice for everyone that uh, seemed worth proposing them for inclusion in the permit. What we want is a, an inventory of your municipal sites that uh, basically have a high likelihood for there being pet waste. So like dog parks, um, hiking trails or other areas that people take their dogs to a lot. I mean, I guess even regular parks that aren't designated dog parks, if you know that they are frequented by dogs. And once you have the inventory, we're asking for like at least a visit to each site once by someone so that you can identify which sites, you know, either have or have potential for more improper disposal. And then you can propose increased maintenance or other practices to uh, 
improve those, those sites. And then this kind of relates back to that new topic that was in public education. That's kind of all related to this too. We're asking that you have some outreach uh, regarding, you know, cleaning up after your pets and not letting that get into the storm sewer, which goes into the river or other water bodies. In the construction section, there's actually kind of a lot of new stuff here for non-traditional permittees because in the existing permit, um, it's pretty basic and just says to have contract language requiring uh, that the construction general permit is implemented. Um, now we're asking for the non-traditionals to do a little bit closer to what the traditional permittees have to do and having like an inventory of all their construction sites, um, doing inspections on those to make sure that that CGP uh, construction general permit contract language is getting implemented and then also having a policy for smaller sites, um, just ensuring that there's an internal policy that, you know, all projects, whether they're fall under the construction general permit or not, have used proper, you know, grading practices and aren't discharging sediment or anything like that during that construction process. So that's kind of all new stuff for non-traditionals. Uh, but I know some non-traditionals, at least one that I visited already kind of does things like that and go out and inspects their ongoing construction projects. Um, then as far as the traditionals, um, we did try to clarify or change slightly the inspection requirements. So in the existing permit, it does ask you to do a prioritization of construction sites, but then I think it's not exactly clear on you know how much more often or how the inspections actually change once you prioritize those sites. So now we're asking that the non-priority sites have an annual inspection and the priority sites are inspected basically like once before the rainy season and once during the rainy season at a minimum. Um, so there's been kind of a lot of definitely moving around and changes in the post-construction section. Um, so I guess, first of all, we made some changes in clarification to some of the exceptions for regulated projects. So one kind of big one is there's currently an exception for single family home projects, uh, over 5,000 square feet of, uh, new or replaced impervious surface in the existing permit. Those are just given an exception. They're just not covered whatsoever. So we're proposing removing that exception. Um, I mean, it just seems like we weren't sure why a you know large house project is treated completely differently than a even if it were just like a multifamily home project right next to it. Um, I mean, the phase one permits that I we looked at all seem to cover single family homes and the region three, the central coast there, they have their own separate post-construction requirements that covers both their phase ones and phase twos. Those include single family homes. Um, so it seemed, I actually wasn't really sure why they were completely excluded in the existing permit. So we're proposing no longer excluding them. Um, we've also tried to clear up some of the definitions of routine road maintenance. I guess that's something that seems like in the various regional boards have kind of run into people not always interpreting that the same. So kind of just tried to clean that up a little bit. Um, and then there's also some attempts to reduce, I guess I would call it piecemealing. Um, like some examples I've heard are, say there's an apartment building going in and as part of the city approving that, they, they tell the builder that they also have to improve the sidewalk in front of it. And sometimes the they try to break that out into two separate things to, to get the total pro size of the project you know, under certain thresholds. And so we've added a like a provision or a sentence or two in there, trying to make it clear that anything that you have to do as part of your building plan approval has to all get counted as one one project, not two separate projects, so that it can trigger certain requirements. Um, we've also changed the name of site design measures to runoff reduction measures. And we've kind of changed the list of what counts for that. Um, I have a 
another slide after this that has kind of a couple more details. So that's all I'll say about that for now. And I'll explain more. Um, then the numeric sizing criteria, which there's kind of in the existing permit, there's two different volumetric options and two different flow-based options. So we still have all those same criteria in there, but the way they're sort of prioritized or the way that a project would uh, fall under one or the other has changed somewhat. Um, and we're also calling them water quality treatment and retention requirements now. So basically, uh, this we worked on this. I worked on this with the regional boards, with the committee of people from across the state, and we had one representative from Region Three, the Central Coast. So if a lot of this seems kind of like it's taking cues from the Central Coast uh, post construction requirements, that's that's because it is. We're taking a lot of cues from there. Uh, they're were heavily involved in drafting this and. I guess they're like happy with how their post construction is working there and we're wanted to share with the statewide phase two permit what what they thought was working well and improvements we could make statewide so uh another change is that the hydro modification uh how a project falls under that requirement currently it's uh one acre or more and we're proposing decreasing that threshold to twenty two thousand square feet which is roughly half of an acre. Um, we're also calling this peak flow control now because I think that title just gets more at what we're preventing hydro modification, but it's by controlling the, the peak flows. Um, and currently in the existing permit, there's kind of like two different standards in different parts of the state. Some are meeting the two year 24 hour storm and some are meeting the 10 year 24 hour storm. Um, and it seems like the, you know, from the studies and stuff show that the hydro modification starts at that two year storm. And we weren't sure what the um, justification in the existing permit is for having the two separate uh, storm criteria across the state. So we've just proposed one criteria, the two year storm across the state. We're, you know, op open to some comments on that. Um, another thing we've done here is kind of made a more clear prioritization of the types of BMPs. I think the existing permit seems to like suggest bioretention as like the top, you know, gold standard BMP, but it, I don't know if it comes right out and, and says there's this exact prioritization the same way that the like region three post-construction requirements do. So that's one uh, thing we've changed here is we tried to just say, right up front that the bioretention is kind of the preferred BMP and then under certain infeasibility criteria or for smaller projects or in certain situations that then you can go down the list to the flow through BMPs and then even other situations or what certain things are met then you can kind of go to these underground subsurface infiltration like storage fault kind of things um I guess some of the regions have had issues under the existing permit of seeming like projects kind of skipping straight sometimes to the subsurface infiltration. I think there's not, not a clear pathway maybe in the existing permit of how to get to that. Um, so that's something that's we're kind of thinking about and putting that in there. Uh, and then we've also added new uh, allowances for offsite compliance. So you can offset some of your retention or your peak flow criteria with other projects in the same watershed. Um, so I think, you know, technically there might have been a way to do that under the existing permit, but it wasn't laid out very clearly and might have required all kinds of approvals. So we're trying to make that more of an actual feasible thing to do. So in the next two slides, there's a lot of information. Basically, I'm trying to lay out a, a flow chart of the process and decision tree that you go through in the post-construction section and highlight the areas that have changed as I see it and understand it. So um, this will be available, you know, when the, the slides are released and in this video that's being recorded. So I'm not going to go through each thing, but basically, you know, the diamonds represent sort of decision points the squares are kind of endpoints. And then the 
rounded off rectangular squares are kind of like processes you would go through to get to the end. So, you know, there's a couple different decisions about do you meet certain size thresholds? Are you, uh, you know, exempted like single family houses were? Then you kind of go down through the different sections of the low impact development standards. Then there's another decision of are you a hydro modification project or not? Um, and either way, that takes you through choosing the different one of the, the criteria that you can design your site based on. That leads you to bioretention. And even though I don't know if it says infeasible and doesn't put this exact prioritization in the existing permit, it does it does kind of have a couple criteria you can meet to go from being bioretention to a flow through. And you do kind of have to demonstrate you're in one of these situations before you go from bioretention down to flow through. Um, and then I have this dotted line here going to subsurface infiltration because, like I said, I we felt like there's kind of an unclear pathway to go from uh, the post instruction requirements to subsurface infiltration, but some people seem to be doing it. And then in the end, that gets you to your final design, which is compliant with one of the uh, numeric criteria and hydro modification as applicable. OK, so on this next slide, everything that's orange are parts of the process that had have changed and in some cases more than others. Um, so for one thing, and then underlines uh, are also showing changes. So, so first off, we've made small projects, projects between 2,500 and 5,000 square feet. We've actually made that a defined term. I think a lot of people already referred to them as small projects, but now that's an actual term in the permit. Um, then the square under there has only changed because of the change I mentioned of now runoff reduction measures are in place as site design measures. This next box is just highlighting the change to the ex uh, exemption for single family homes. Then a lot of parts of the um, low impact design standards are still the same, source control measures, site, site assessment, uh, dividing your project up into the drainage management areas. That's all pretty much staying the same. Then you have the runoff reduction measures, which have changed, but um, it, it's more of a change to the name and to the, to the list of what's accepted, but it's still kind of the, the process is still the same. Then when you get to the hydro modification decision, that part's changed because we're proposing this decreased threshold. There's also a slight change in the wording of exactly what you have to, to meet, which is match the pre-development peak flow condition from the two years, 24 hour storm. Then depending on the size of your project, um, if it's below 22,000 feet, you can use the, basically the flow criteria or the volumetric criteria. But um, once you're above 22,000 square feet, um, you know, to kind of emphasize the bioretention sort of being the like gold standard BMP, you know, you have to use this re retention sizing and not the flow sizing. Then once you, then we kind of get over to the, the BMP types here, and we've tried to make this more clear linkage of bioretention first, if if you can, then if that's not feasible and in certain situations, then you can move down the line to flow through. And then if in other certain situations or if certain criteria met, then you can move to this subsurface infiltration. And then those will feed into your final design that meets the applicable criteria. Um, and then this little box down here also shows that um, offsite compliance that can help meet your retention and the peak flow criteria. So this slide is to show the change from site design measures to runoff reduction measures. Um, so a couple of them we've, we've sort of combined into one, the stream setbacks, vegetated swales, and impervious area disconnection. Um, we're kind of calling those all impervious connection to vegetated areas now, or that kind of gets at what the main benefit from each of those is that we're wanting to get out of these. Um, and most of the other ones just have like a direct, you know, equivalent new runoff reduction measure. Um, the only one that didn't uh, move over is soil quality improvement and maintenance. 
that was one that was kind of uh, hard to assess, you know, what was actually being done and how much if, if we were actually getting the measurable benefit from it. Um, all the regional board representatives just felt like this was kind of a not a good site design measure. It was just hard to enforce and basically don't want to give like credit for it and have to pick from this other list now. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to say about site design measures and runoff reduction measures, there is a lot more words about them in the permit now. In the existing permit, there's kind of just a brief description of each one. And then it refers to this Excel calculator to find out you know, what credit you'll actually get for it. But it really doesn't lay out any criteria or guidelines on you know, what you have to do to get to for these to count. And so they take up a lot more space in the informal draft because we're trying to lay out some of those criteria, like for tree planting, you know, where does the tree actually have to be in relation to your project and how big of a tree does it have to be, you know, et cetera. And then I think we've tried to put in, you know, what credit you should actually get for that instead of referring to this external Excel calculator document. So that's why this section is seems like it's expanded a lot. But what we tried to do is just take information that was kind of referred to elsewhere and make it make sure everyone was on the same page with what each of these are. <clears throat> um, another new thing in the post construction section is a kind of more specificity at, about this assessment of post-construction uh, controls. So the existing program already has a self-certification uh, program, and it does mention an assessment that needs to be done, but I think it doesn't really make it exactly clear if that's an assessment by the permittee or by the owner of the structural control. And so we're trying to clarify that that's an assessment that we want the, the small MS4 permittee to do, so the one who's overseeing the post-construction program. And We've basically sort of added on to that to clarify that we want there to be on-site inspections for at least half of the post-construction of all the public and privately owned post-construction uh, BMPs per five years. Um, alternatively, if you know if you're going to have to go out and inspect half of them anyway, if that kind of makes the self-certification program not seem worth it, we've also added an option where you can skip the self-certification and just do a permittee-led inspection program, but that one would require uh, an inspection of each site at least once every five years instead of half the sites. So that's it for the six minimum control measures. So now on to a couple other parts of the uh, permit. So there are some changes to monitoring. Um, so in the existing permit, there's basically four types of monitoring. There's TMDLs, 303D listed water bodies, ASBS, and then there's this kind of more general receiving water and special studies that if you're above a certain size threshold and you don't have any of the previously mentioned monitoring, you'd fall under this more general monitoring. Well, we've decided to remove this general monitoring requirement, so there's no section for receiving water or special studies anymore. It only applied to a handful of permittees. And after kind of like looking through their, what they had done and discussing it, it wasn't clear exactly how that was affecting their program implementation. And, um, you know, we decided just to not to continue that requirement. But there is still TMDL monitoring, it varies from TMDL to TMDL. Also, not every TMDL requires monitoring. So you kind of have to check if you're in one whether it has monitoring requirements or not. Um, then if you discharge to a 303D listed water body within one year of the permit adoption, you have to consult with the regional water board and um, see if there's any monitoring to do to inform your uh, stormwater program. Uh, if you're in an area of special biological significance, you may or may not have to do additional monitoring. Um, I think that covers, that covers the monitoring part of the permit. 
So in annual reporting, um, there are some new questions. So in addition to kind of the existing, the existing annual report kind of just goes line by line through the permanent asks, you know, are you doing this? Yes or no? Leave, leave some more uh, sentences that, or a paragraph if you want, but it doesn't require you to. We try to add some new questions, um, maybe to make it easier for someone from the public or someone from the regional boards that are kind of just doing like a desktop search or a desktop type audit to maybe get more information about what's actually going on in on on the ground. Um, so some of like the inventories that you have to do, I think we're maybe asking more specifically for submittal of those more often than maybe the existing permit requires. Uh, and a couple other new questions. Then for traditional permittees specifically, uh, there's kind of a carve out here for cost reporting. That's something that the uh, STORMS program, that's another unit at the State Water Board um, that does kind of more high level stormwater planning. They're working on this cost reporting policy. And if that gets adopted by the State Water Board, then this section will kind of be triggered and require traditional permittees to do cost reporting. Um, we are still kind of assessing exactly how the reporting we want overlaps with the US EPA's uh, electronic reporting rule or the e-rule. So as we finish that assessment, there could be additional questions added or the questions might be changed somewhat so that we're reporting them in the right format. Um, but yeah, that's something we're still looking at. So that could augment the reporting somewhat. And then if you're in a TMDL or an ASBS, there's additional reporting that goes with those. Uh, next, I'm just gonna touch a little bit on the total maximum daily loads or TMDLs. Um, so a TMDL, it's a plan to reduce pollutants and uh, restore water bodies to a certain water quality level so that they're meeting their beneficial uses. It um, defines how much of a pollutant a water body can basically take and still meet the water quality standards. Um, so it kind of like identifies all the sources of this pollutant within a watershed or along a reach of the water body and sort of assigns different uh, amounts that to each one of those. Uh, but the TMDL is just a plan. It's actually not implemented or enforceable until it's put into a permit. So that's why we have to write the TMDLs into the phase two permit. So the TMDLs are located in attachment G. Um, there's 14 new ones in addition to all the existing ones in the current permit. We've grouped them by regional board and um, even kind of left a placeholder for one regional board that doesn't have any. So that should make them a little easier to navigate. Um, but each TMDL, a lot of them are pretty unique. I'm really not gonna go through each one. They're kind of specific to each permittee and each water body. Um, so, you kind of have to go in and, and check and do a search for your your name and see if you're in this attachment and if there's any additional requirements on you from that attachment. So of the 14 new TMDLs, uh, most of those are in the San Francisco Bay region and the Central Coast region, although there are a couple more uh, in North Coast, Central Valley, and Santa Ana. So for each TMDL, we've kind of tried to organize them in the same way where it lists out their responsible permittees, it names the impaired water bodies, uh, and then it kind of gives the implementation requirements. So that's the part that's going to be kind of unique and different for each TMDL. Then there's the final compliance deadline and any reporting or monitoring requirements would also be here in attachment G. So even though the TMDLs are mostly unique, there are a couple that are kind of grouped. So in the San Francisco region, region two, uh, they do have some general requirements for their bacteria and pathogen team DLs. And Los Angeles region kind of has a similar uh, standardized requirements for their bacteria team DLs. And then the central coast region, um, they have this kind of standardized planning that they ask each permittee with a TMDL to do that they call a waste load allocation attainment plan. 
So in the San Francisco region, uh, these bacteria, this bacteria general approach it applies to six different permittees and it kind of lays out just a couple different program areas that they all have to do to like evaluate where the bacteria is coming from and certain source control measures they have to put into place and what the, you know, what compliance levels they have to meet. In the Los Angeles region, these are mostly carried over from the existing permit, whereas the San Francisco one, I think, kind of expands on what the existing permit has. Um, these uh, ones in LA, I think, are kind of mostly carried over from the current permit. Uh, and they kind of all end up being this choice where you have to either choose whether you're doing your own TMDL program and submit it to the board or you've entered into a cooperative agreement with other MS4s. And uh, yeah, basically that's just carried forward into this one. Uh, on the Central Coast, they did add some more specific details that they want in the wasteload allocation attainment plans. Um, basically, they've been looking over all the ones su submitted under the existing permit, and there are just some more details they needed to kind of assure those are moving forward and assess whether they're being effective or not. Um, so those are all in attachment G at the beginning of the Central Coast region's TMDLs. So the TMDLs don't all include monitoring, but uh, a lot of them do. Um, whether or not you have monitoring, you just have to check for that specific TMDL in attachment G and kind of read thoroughly through the end of the requirements and see if it lays out any monitoring you have to do. Then depending on which stage of TMDL implementation you're in or which region you're in, there could be a couple different reporting requirements. There is just a general TMDL annual reporting requirement that's applicable to everybody. Um, but then there could also be specific reports for the regional board. If you're at a point where you're actually ready to demonstrate compliance with the TMDL, that's a also a separate report you'd have to file. Um, if you're not going to demonstrate compliance by the time your TMDL is due, then you might have to submit a request for a time schedule order. And you also might have to submit reporting uh, for approval of cooperative projects. So those are all kind of laid out um, in the permit if you have to do any of those. So one new thing that could uh, be helpful with TMDLs is an alternative compliance option. This is under attachment I. Um, so it'll help satisfy not only your TMDL compliance, but also discharge prohibitions and effluent receiving water limitations. This can be on-site or off-site, and it's just a capture requirement to capture the 85th percentile storm. This was based on uh, a similar alternative compliance option from the uh, industrial general permit. So we tried to just take their attachment that dealt with this and sort of reworded and make it applicable to small MS4s. So it wasn't written necessarily just for traditionals or non-traditionals. We thought we tried to write it in a way that would be kind of applicable to everybody. And especially since kind of a lot of the point of it was to emphasize this collaborative offsite option. Um, yeah, the idea is that, you know, maybe two permittees, maybe one permittee who's right next to another one might have a better site for capturing more stormwater, more than the neighbor permittee could capture by themselves. And so if you kind of went in together on this project, you might be able to share costs and meet compliance, at least for that section that captures the stormwater. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Nick, and he's going to discuss the uh, trash implementation requirements. Hello, I'm Nicholas Wong. I'm going to go over the uh, trash requirements. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So first, I'm going to touch on the tra statewide trash provisions. The trash provisions are amended. The following state water 
Board Water Quality Control Plans, Appendix D of the Water Quality Control Plan for Ocean Waters of California, and Appendix E of the Water Quality Control Plan for Inland Surface Waters, Enclosed Bays, and Estuaries of California. And generally, the implementation language, the trash implementation language in the permit builds upon the base provided by the trash provisions by giving specifics necessary for implementation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, trash provisions, implementation requirements, they are effective December 2nd, 2015, includes compliance deadlines, includes both traditional and non-traditional municipal stormwater permittees, and directs the issuance of the 13383 Water Code Orders to all permittees on June 1st, 2017, which required the selection of compliance track and submittal of a map identifying priority land uses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll go over the, the two tracks that are for the trash provisions and the two compliance tracks. Uh, first, there's track one, which is to install, operate, and maintain bolt capture systems and storm drains to capture trash in runoff. And then there's track two, which is to install, operate, and maintain any combination of full capture systems, multi-benefit projects, and other treatment controls and or institutional controls to capture or reduce trash in runoff. And new permittees are required to select a compliance track via SMARTS within 60 days of enrollment for coverage under this order. Uh, next slide, please. So first is compliance track one, which is to install trash full capture systems only. Uh, they're, they're, it's required to, con to install all these at priority land uses. Uh, it includes multi conditionally certified multi-benefit systems uh, full capture systems must trap all particles five millimeters or trash particles five millimeters in diameter or greater and must have a design treatment capacity that is either uh, no less than the peak flow rate resulting from a one year, one hour storm event or the design storm in the sub drainage area or at least sized and designed to carry at least the same flows as the corresponding storm drain. And next slide, please. And then next is track compliance track two, which is full capture system equivalency. And uh, the permit is required to demonstrate full capture system equivalency by implementing trash control measures that reduce an equivalent amount of trash as the installation as the installation of a full capture system at all priority land uses. Uh, they're to select areas of trash generation for treatment, establish baseline trash generation levels, and show trash reduction via trash assessments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm going to go over the definition for priority land uses, and that includes high density residential acre areas with 10 or more dwelling units per acre, industrial land uses, commercial land uses, and mixed urban land uses, and public transportation systems. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to go over the uh, each of the requirements. And the and the attachment H of the which is the trash implementation requirements. Um, this will be a broad overview of the trash requirements. Uh, if you want a more detailed overview of what each requirement requires, please see attachment H of the small MS4 permit for more detailed instructions. Um, so the first requirement is uh, H1 trash discharge prohibition, and basically it says that the discharge of trash to surface waters of the state or the deposition of trash where it may be discharged into surface waters of the state is prohibited and permittees are required to comply with the trash discharge prohibition uh, by requiring with the by complying with the requirements in the identified in attachment H. And next slide, please. Uh, so next requirement is the requirement H2, compliance deadline. So for renewal permittees, they're, they're, they are to demonstrate compliance by December 2nd, 2030. And then for new permittees, they are to demonstrate compliance within 10 years of the order's effective date or by the effective date of the per of permittees uh, designation, whichever is later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next requirement is requirement H4, a certified trash full capture systems. And it states that, um, yeah, they must trap, uh, uh, the full capture systems must trash trap trash particles five millimeters or greater in diameter, 
and must be sized for the design uh, storm, the one year, one hour storm. And then uh, you can find a list of the certified full capture systems on the State Water Board's website and on the CASC website. Uh, manufacturers may apply to certify a new trash full capture system and a separate, ap separate application is available for certification of project specific trash full capture systems. Uh, next slide, please. And again, uh, requirement H5 is uh, details the compliance tracks uh, and the requirements are organized in four different categories. There's traditional track one and track two permittees and then non-traditional track one and track two permittees. Next slide, please. So the next requirement is requirement H6, the trash implementation inventory. And the permit requirements are organized again in the four different categories. Uh, and for track one, traditional track one, uh, they're required to list all sub drainage areas containing priority land use areas. And then for the other three, they're required to list all sub drainage areas that generate some significant amounts or substantial amounts of trash. Uh, they're all permittees are required to update the inventory annually and distinguish between already treated and remaining to be treated acreage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next uh, requirement is H7, the trash generation map. And again, the permit requirements are organized by traditional and non-traditional uh, permittees. And so for traditional tr permittees, they're required, the map should include all priority land use, land use sub-drainage areas and locations of full capture systems. And then for non-traditional, um, the maps should include locations that generate substantial amounts of trash and locations of full capture systems and treatment controls. Um, and because the map is one of the few deliverables, uh, or a few regular regular deliverable, the deliverables, it is one of the few documents that the public and the water boards have to monitor progress year to year. Um, so that's why it needs to be updated um, annually, or um, yeah, regularly, and then, um, yeah, so a new, so, Permittees are required to submit new and, and updated trash generation map via SMARTS, and it should be color-coded, identifying low, moderate, high, and very high trash generation areas. Uh, next slide, please. So next requirement is H8, the trash assessment plan. It calls for on-land visual trash assessment methodology or other assessment methodology upon approval. Uh, requires that Renewal permittees may, or states that renewal permittees may rely on previous trash assessments, but must update uh, update the plan for new trash, trash generation areas. Uh, the map depicting, uh, must include the map depicting previous and future trash assessment areas, uh, include uh, annual trash assessments of all, of all already treated areas, uh, trash assessment field procedures, and quality assurance and control procedures. And uh, annual assessments or um, or statistic, statistically representative set of locations or land uses of similar trash generation levels will determine the trash load reduction. Uh, next slide, please. Next requirement is uh, H9, the trash implementation plan. And it must include the schedule for the installation and, and implementation of full capture systems the location, area, trash reduction, and design treatment capacity of each full capture system, an annual evaluation of progress towards achieving milestones, and must include coordination. Uh, uh, um, yeah, must include coordination with Caltrans for any areas with trash generation impacted by both the permittee and Caltrans. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next requirement is requirement H10, which is the full capture system equivalency for permittees in Track 2. And basically, it just states that Track 2 permittees must demonstrate that the combinations of treatment controls achieve full capture, uh, full capture system equivalency. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next requirement is requirement H11, and the details the trash reduction milestones for renewal permittees um, so the first milestone is December 2nd, 2026, and it calls for 30% uh, uh, yeah, um, of the areas identified 
It uh, calls for a 30% coverage by full capture systems. And then second milestone calls for a 65% coverage on or before December 2nd, 2028. And a final compliance of 100% coverage on or before December 2nd, uh, 2030. And permittees may request approval of alternative, alternate first and second milestones. Uh, next slide, please. And then for uh, trash reduction milestones for, for new permittees, it calls for 40% coverage within uh, four years of the effective date. And that's the first milestone. Second milestone is 70% within seven years of the effective date. Uh, full compliance is 100% uh, within 10 years of the effective date. And again, requests for alternate first and second milestones uh, must be approved by the Regional Water Board Executive Officer. Uh, next slide, please. The next requirement is for inspection and maintenance. Um, and then so the minimum inspection um, and maintenance requirements uh, should include uh, certified full capture systems, categorically certified multi-benefit systems, and other treatment controls and institutional controls. And it calls for the development of an inspection and maintenance schedule and frequency that maintains the design treatment capacity. And it also calls that for the, the frequency must increase when a full capture system is 50% or more filled with trash. And again, this is just a broad overview, a more detailed list of what should be included uh, can be found again in attachment H of the small MS4 permit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next requirement is H14, Regional Water Board Determinations. Uh, basically, it states that the Regional wa Water Board Executive Officer may determine that additional areas generate substantial amounts of trash, such as parks, recreation areas, and high traffic roads, and that the Regional Water Board <clears throat> Executive Officer may give up to 10 years to comply for new additional areas. Next slide, please. Uh, next requirement is H15, record retention, and basically it states that permittees must retain the following records, uh, the current trash implementation inventory, the current trash generation map, uh, current trash implementation plan, uh, the trash assessment plan, and the inspection and maintenance records, including any inspection and maintenance schedules as required in requirement H13. And next slide, please. Um, so requirement H16 is the annual trash monitoring report, and it states that both track one and two permittees must report um, either the all the full capture systems that are already installed and the ones to be installed, uh, the total number of installed full capture systems and the total acreage, uh, certification that each installed system is operated and maintained to consistently achieve the design treatment capacity, and a description and timeline to address deficiencies. And then additionally, for track two permittees, they must also report other treatment and institutional controls and respective acreage and the effectiveness of con those controls based on trust assessments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, requirement H17 states that the reporting items, and it states that within 60 days of designation, uh, new permittees uh, must select track one or track two. Uh, also states that within 180 days of the effective date, uh, permittees are required to submit a trash generation map and annually submit updated trash and annual submit an updated trash generation map via SMARTS, either to submit an annual trash monitoring report via SMARTS, and they are to annually provide their local vector control agencies with the name and location of existing certified full capture systems and the proposed certified full capture systems that will be installed during the following reporting year. And next slide, please. And so now we'll move on to ASBS. Hi everyone, my name is Flora Luo and I am an environmental scientist with the Water Board. Today I will be going over the areas of special biological significance portion of this presentation. Next slide, please. ASBS is the acronym for Areas of Special Biological Significance, ocean areas designated by the State Water Board requiring protection of species to ensure the natural ocean water quality is maintained. 
the permit's ASBS requirements implement the State Water Board Resolution for the exceptions to the California Ocean Plan for selected discharges into areas of special biological significance. ASBS are located on the California coast and within the jurisdictions of the North Coast, San Francisco Peak Bay, Central Coast, and Santa Ana Regional Water Boards. Next slide, please. Here's a quick look to see the ASBS regulated under this permit and the related regional water boards. Next slide, please. I will quickly go over the updated ASBS compliance plan requirements. No later than 12 months after the effective date of this order, the permittee shall submit an updated ASBS compliance plan for review and consideration of approval. The permittee's updated ASBS compliance plan shall include the following. The original plan submitted under the previous permit, revisions to the monitoring plan for resampling if resampling was not completed under the previous permit, statement indicating whether the permittee completed the core monitoring, ocean receiving monitoring, and resampling that were required under the previous permit, monitoring results, updated installation and implementation schedule of BMPs, Updated map showing installed and planned BMP locations, priority discharge locations, and sheet flow drainage of stormwater runoff. And finally, plans to complete the core discharge monitoring and or the ocean receiving uh, water and reference area monitoring. For additional information on the updated ASBS compliance plan requirements, please refer to section F3 of attachment F. Next slide, please. Let's move on and discuss core discharge and ocean receiving water monitoring. This is for dischargers who have not completed the monitoring under the previous permit. For the core discharge monitoring program, there are general sampling requirements for timing and storm size, runoff flow measures, and storm event sampling. In order to fulfill the requirements for ocean receiving water monitoring, permittees must choose either an individual monitoring program or participate in a regional integrated monitoring program. For more details regarding both the core discharge and ocean receiving uh, water monitoring, uh, please refer to section F6 of attachment F. Next slide, please. And finally, ASBS reporting. Permittees shall submit their annual ASBS compliance status report on October 15th of each year. The report will cover the period of July 1st through June 30th of each year and shall be submitted through SMARTS. The report shall include description and status of compliance, description of sampling or resampling results, description of BMP installations and their status, description of any low impact development BMPs installed over the reporting year and tabulated monitoring results. Um, now, I will pass this back to Paul, who will be going over the next steps for the permit development. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, as outlined in the public notice for this meeting, um, there is a uh, comment, public comment email that we are collecting public comments in, additionally to this small MS4 workshop email that you're sending your questions into right now. So um, for the questions we're receiving now, as well as the ones we're receiving in this public comments email, um, we are planning on doing kind of a high level uh, response to the comments, not quite as detailed as would be in the official public comment process. Then we'll be uh, drafting another version of the permit based on those comments. Um, that may or may not be um, going through the more formal public comment process, um, depending which there could be multiple drafts, but likely the next one will, will be released for a more official public comment. Uh, there will be a public hearing. Um, uh, we'll have to do a more thorough consideration in response to all public comments in the more formal uh, step. Um, then we'll do another draft with revisions based on those comments, and that draft could potentially go to the water board for adoption at a board meeting. So there's kind of like 
several, well, maybe not several, there's, there's definitely at least a few more steps after this one where there will be more drafts and more opportunity to comment on the permit. Uh, so now that we've finished that kind of lengthy presentation, we're going to take a 15 minute break. Sorry, I'm actually going to put the correct time in here. So we'll be back at 2.30. Um, in the meantime, you know, we're, we've already received a, a handful of questions through email. So we're going to kind of start to sort through those and uh, come back and answer which ones we can. You're welcome to continue sending questions uh, while we're gone. And then we have, I think, until four o'clock to answer questions potentially. So keep sending your questions to smallness for workshop at waterboards.ca.gov. And uh, we'll see you back here at 2.30.
Uh, all right, uh, we're returning from our break. And we've been receiving a bunch of questions from you all in the email. Um, we're gonna try to answer them where we can, or at least note them. Um, and, you know, even if we can't answer your question, you know, part of this whole informal process is, uh, you know, just getting feedback from you all and taking it back to kind of like consider further, even if it's something we can't answer right now. Um, so I'll start off. Uh, let's see, we had a question uh, from City of Seaside about the pipe inventory for asset management. And they asked if previous master plan documentation can count for that. Um, and yes, I think things like um, master plans can can count for some of that asset management requirements. Um, as far as the inventory, I mean, if the master plan has kind of like an estimate of pipes, that might be something you have to, you know, technically put as a line in the inventory, but that should be, you know, a lot easier if it's already kind of in, you know, estimates included in this master plan. And then additionally, I think those kind of documents could count towards some of the, the long-term, longer-term planning requirements that are at the end of the asset management section. Um, City of Seaside also asked if the continuation of current outreach efforts can count for the pest weight no pest, pet waste notification. And um, yes, if it meets the kind of uh, more the what's in the permits a little more specific than what I put on the slide. But uh, I mean, if you already have existing um, outreach that does that, then yeah, I mean, that, that kind of goes for most stuff in the permit. If you're kind of already doing something that meets the requirement, um, you can just continue doing that and kind of document your annual report, how you're meeting that. Um, there were a couple questions about the industrial and commercial inspections from different commenters, um, kind of whether it's duplicative of the IGP or if it's something that the state water board should be doing to basically be inspecting the IGP. And uh, I think with this, the idea that this is asking for is maybe not asking for an inspection of the full you know, compliance with the IGP, I think it's a little bit higher level than that. Um, but that is something I guess that we should, could consider or maybe look more into. Um, that's kind of like overlapping with waterboard inspections related to the IGP. Um, there was also some concern about the um, these inspections, industrial and commercial inspections, as they relate to the non-traditionals. Um, and this was a case where uh, we actually, I, I'm not really sure how many, which non-traditionals this will apply to. I guess for some, they probably don't have too many of these types of facilities that aren't under their own jurisdiction. And then inspections would already be done under the pollution prevention and good housekeeping, which kind of covers your own facilities that are under your ownership and control. Um, but yeah, for certain permittees that do have kind of like tenants and commercial or industrial sites within their jurisdiction that aren't like directly under their control. Um, yeah, there's one comment here about potentially using other things as a means of compliance, like tenancy agreements um, or other means of compliance that don't require inspection. And actually, um, that's a, uh, a great comment and maybe something we hadn't fully considered. Um, I mean, that could be something that could applic be applicable to uh, traditional permittees too. Maybe there could be like a 
maybe two di different options you could choose from like an on-site inspection versus a meeting with these agreements or some kind of like a self-certification kind of thing. Um, so that's one maybe pathway we that could be considered there to sort of move forward somewhat on that topic without but giving more options than just just the inspections. Um, we had another question from a non-traditional, um, yeah, basically asking how can they develop an inventory and, and do inspections if they're not authorized to access commercial and industrial facilities uh, with potential discharge pollutants. And so I guess I'm, I know there's kind of a lot of different situations that the non-traditionals exist and operate in. So, I mean, I think it's written with the intention of only covering facilities that are within your jurisdiction that you could, you know, possibly have the ability to inspect and access. I mean, if you don't have authorization to access them in, in any way, then I guess it um, makes me wonder if they're in your, I guess exactly how that gets counted in your jurisdiction, if that would fall under the list or not. So that could be one of those situations where it's a non-traditional that that section isn't maybe actually isn't fully applicable to. Um, so another question from, yeah, actually, I think from the same permittee, which is a non-traditional uh, with a kind of similar question about asset management. And how can a permittee access the public storm drain system uh, infrastructure and include the level of detail requested? It's basically the permittee can inspect the storm drain infrastructure within their jurisdiction. However, how can a permittee gain access to storm drain infrastructure that is outside of their jurisdiction? So uh, I guess, I guess I assumed it was like that it would only cover your own jurisdiction. I'm kind of not sure which situations this specific question is dealing with, like where your jurisdiction like meets another permittee's jurisdiction. I mean, I think that's where your uh, inventory would end, but I'm, maybe I'm not fully understanding the this question or comment and the, the previous one about uh, commercial and industrial inspections. Uh, so more questions from this non-traditional permittee about inspecting the post-construction structural controls and that in some cases this would be redundant because, okay, there are some on this, so for metropolitan transit system, there are some Caltrans structural controls that I guess sounds like overlap with their facilities, but Caltrans is already inspecting those. Um, so this permit is asking why they'd have to do extra inspections on top of that. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a situation where um, I'm not sure I fully understand how the jurisdictions are overlapping. Um, so I think either you'd only be expected to do the ones in your jurisdiction or yeah, I think maybe I'd have to be kind of educated a little more on how these stormwater systems over overlap in situations like that. And then they also asked for an example of a private structural control BMP. So that would be more applicable to a traditional permittee, I think, where in a municipal uh, municipality's jurisdiction, they might have city-owned BMPs. Those would be public. And then there would also be privately owned BMPs that, you know, private businesses that have to put in uh, like a bioretention pond during construction. So that would be an example of a private structural control. And again, kind of back to the jurisdiction question. I mean, I think everything in the permit can really only refer to things that are under your jurisdiction.
Um, we had a question about annual reporting and whether we anticipate that uh, it'll still be through SMARTS, similar to the current process, or if the permittees will be expected to, to develop a standalone document to be uploaded to SMARTS. Um, no, I think we're still assuming it's going to go through SMARTS and there will still be, um, yeah, if anything, it's going to be less like a standalone because part of this uh, EPA's e-rule is that they want uh, information across different stormwater programs to be uh, able to be kind of like added together and used together. So, uh, and this kind of goes to another question that's asking how the E electronic reporting rule might change the final permit. Basically, the, the EPA might want to know, uh, they might want questions to be asked in a certain way so that they could come up with some, do like a roll up of the entire country and say, well, you know, across all the stormwater programs, we've, there have been this many outreach events of this type. So, like, where we might just want to ask you a generic question like, have you completed your outreach re requirement or how many outreach events did you do? The uh, US EPA's electronic reporting rule might want us to get more specific information like how many newspaper article or newspaper ads did you publish? How many uh, internet Google banners did you use? Or how many of your uh, utility letters included a, a message about a certain topic? And so, yeah, they, I think they kind of want some more standardized reporting. And so that's kind of how that might affect uh, the way the questions are asked uh, for the permit. But yeah, I think that will still be through SMARTS. So, in, and SMARTS does have some of that capability. We could set up the questions kind of differently than they are right now, but um, I think we just don't fully use that for all the annual report questions. Uh, so we have a question about alternative compliance, noting that it seems written for individual properties, for example, a school or commercial permittees, which is probably kind of true since we were trying to adapt it from the industrial general permit. Um, but they wanted to know how is a municipality uh, to comply with the post-construction standard to capture a sufficient volume uh, and there seems to be a big difference between an individual plot of land capturing stormwater to a design standard versus a municipal volume stormwater. Uh, will municipalities be required to conduct a, an RAA, which is a reasonable assurance analysis, similar to the Los Angeles uh, WIMPs and eWIMPs, so that's watershed management plans and enhanced watershed management plans, or is any discharge above 85th percentile storm violation and the permit will not be deemed in compliance? How will the water board know when this occurs? Um, so I think that is kind of true that it, it would be pretty hard to show that you're meeting this full capture option for an entire municipality. But I think this could help you show that you're in compliance in certain like parts of the municipality. And so it seems like maybe that could, you could either have multiple projects like this that kind of add up to meet compliance within the TMDL area, or maybe it will only help you meet compliance for part of the TMDL area. And then the things that you have to do as part of your TMDL, you only have to do in what's left. And since the TMDLs are so kind of individual, it really depends if that's going to end up being worth it or not. Um, I guess it kind of depends what the team DL requirements are. Um, but as far as the reasonable assurance analysis, we didn't, and the watershed management plans, we didn't add a whole option like that because those are pretty complex. And like, I think a lot of the regional boards seem to still be grappling with some of the RAAs they're getting from the phase ones. So uh, 
we weren't sure how much that option would be used or if we kind of had the bandwidth to actually re review all those. Um, but I mean, if that's something that like, you know, you as a permittee think you want to do in your jurisdiction, um, I mean, we definitely accept comments on wanting that as an option or how you think that that could be incorporated. Um, relating to the TMDLs, bacteria TMDLs in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, someone asked, which permittees are subject to the general approach for controlling bacteria? Um, and there are, I think, six. Oh, wait, which permittees? Um, I'd have to open up the permit to confirm, but it's all the ones that are under the Napa River TMDL, the Sonoma Creek TMDL, Tamales Bay Watershed Pathogens TMDL, Richardson Bay Pathogens TMDL, San Francisco Bay Beaches Bacteria TMDL, and the Petaluma River Bacteria TMDLs. Um, and so it looks like those... I'm just going to pull up the list here. So that would include American Canyon, Calistoga, St. Helena, uh, City of Napa, Mountville, County of Napa, uh, City of Sonoma, County of Sonoma, Sonoma County Water Agency, Tamales Bay, um, I'm sorry, I mean, Marin County, uh, City of Belvedere, City of Mill Valley, City of Sausalito, Town of Tiburon, County of Marin, um, Handful of State Parks, Candlestick Point, State Recreation Area, uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, Columbia Gate National Recreation Area, oh, China Camp State Park, McNears Beach, County of Marin. Um, and yeah, basically if you pull up attachment G and go to any of the region uh, two pathogen uh, TMDLs, I think those are the ones that, that the standard approach would apply to. And then kind of on a similar topic, uh, someone asked for the Bay Area PCBs and Mercury TMDL, can we share the justification or scientific rationale to include some non-traditionals, but not others? Um, and if there is none, then why are some being treated differently? Um, that's kind of getting into a site-specific question that I'm not sure about in that exact case. Um, and so actually additional to this question and also from another uh, questioner, they were kind of asking about, there's kind of a disconnect between some of the language in attachment G and some language that region two has been discussing with permittees. And the reason for that is because region two was kind of working up to the last minute on this language. I think the language you all are mentioning that is more recent than what's in the permit here in the informal draft. And we just didn't get that in time from region two to incorporate it. So we kind of just put in what, what we had and um, yeah, since it's kind of an informal in nature, we, I guess we should have noted that, you know, this was just the best we had at the time and that region two was still working on it, but uh, we are aware that Region 2 has been discussing some different language with the permittees than what we have in certain sections here. Uh, and it sounds like maybe that language that Region 2 is discussing with some permittees wasn't uh, widely circulated to all the permittees and 
there's maybe some worry that it's not going to go through the public comment process. And yeah, again, this is kind of getting to like a specific regional issue that I don't fully have all the answers to, but the definitely was not the intent to kind of like skip over the process with that whatsoever. And uh, uh, there will definitely be more opportunities to comment during the formal process um, or while you're still, if you're still having discussions with region two on the language right now. Okay, so I also got um, a lot of comments about post-construction. Um, so let's see, I'm not sure how to kind of group these all together. Um, some people are kind of expressed concern that this prioritization won't be possible based on their specific site conditions. Um, I mean, I and I, I think the idea was to have it set up in a way that um, you know, you could meet these infeasibility criteria and then use these other designs like a subsurface infiltration. Uh, if your topsoil is too clay and preventing you from doing the biofiltration. Um, I mean, I think the idea was to allow for that. Um, but if we, if it is written in such a way that it just completely stops that from moving forward, because that's a situation that's not accounted for, then I guess we'd like would like more comments on that. So we sort of uh understand how the current way that the uh pathway to this subsurface filtration or the prioritization is kind of not gonna work for you. Um also a couple comments regarding that basically people would like to see more of the kind of like background justification for these post-construction requirements. Um, yeah, and basically have we thought about how they will impact, you know, sites widely throughout the state that have different soil and groundwater uh, conditions. Um, so we did try to think about that, but you know, of course, that's why we're going through this informal process to try and get more, more feedback on this permit that does cover such a wide area. Um, and we do realize that it will be um, like any change to the post construction requirements, even a small change would would be a burden to update guidance regarding those. Um, Uh, and then just also kind of some a question about whether the way this is written will sort of disallow some proprietary devices that non-traditionals were hoping to, to be able to use in specific situations at airports and seaports. Um, and so maybe that's another con uh, situation where I don't know if there's a way that could be added to the infeasibility criteria if that doesn't kind of fit into the way we've worded to get through the down to the flow through of proprietary devices. Um, I think there's like a general uh, situational criteria that'll let you use proprietary devices, but so maybe there's a way that that could be altered to also kind of cover this situation. I mean, so for example, right now there's there's a call out which is actually carried over from the current permit that says in areas where you know certain control measure placement is infeasible, like a plaza or elevated structure, then you can use these specific like flow through planters. So I don't know if a call out like that for these um, you know specific situations could also be added to that list of uh, exceptions. Um, 
let's see. I've got a lot of questions from uh, Contech Engineered Solutions, a lot of good uh, comments and questions on the post-construction requirements. And um, yeah, I know actually we even had some like previous discussions where Contech had some really specific suggestions for us on how to improve the um, this some of these changes with the post-construction. Um, and so we're definitely looking forward to seeing like a more tra like track change right up with suggestion, which I sounded like they had something like that for us. Uh, we would definitely consider that. Um, so, but I will kind of, kind of go through, try to go through a couple of their questions here. Um, is there a path to meeting post-construction requirements using structural control measures on projects greater than 22 square feet? This flowchart presented today seems to show a path where bioretention is infeasible. Um, I guess I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, and also, yeah, you know, I'm, I would say the flow chart is, I'm kind of trying to interpret what's in the permit, but it might not exactly reflect what the permit says. It was just my attempt to display it. Um, so I can go back to the flow chart for a second. So what's the question. Oh, so I see. Maybe his question is if you are over 22,000 square feet and you're still going in this direction, you could still potentially show that bioretention was infeasible and get down to a flow through or subsurface infiltration, even though you're over 22,000 square feet. Um, I think that's potentially true. Also, since this new offsite compliance can help you offset the retention or peak flow, then you could use a flow through or something else on site to meet meet the uh, a smaller amount of the post construction requirement. Um, okay, there's another question from Contact saying that uh, the section only allows biofiltration where infiltration is technically infeasible. Um, most phase one permits that prioritize retention over treatment structural control measures have a lower infiltration rate threshold, below which biofiltration or other uh, structural control measures are allowed. This ranges from 0.3 to 0.5 inches per hour. Are you open to setting a similar infiltration rate threshold and allowing treatment of all or a portion of the treatment design storm on projects with marginal infiltration rates, regardless of the project size? So I think that kind of relates back to what I was just thinking through. I think you could potentially have a larger project that is doing some on-site treatment, so potentially to this these water quality flow standards through a flow-through device but then to meet the higher retention and peak flow, those could be combined with other things. So yeah, I think maybe this prioritization also isn't completely taking into account like a combinations of uh, structural controls that are sort of chained together. Um, so maybe this is, might be kind of like an overly simplistic way of looking or looking at it or thinking about it. So that's a good comment. Uh, also, contact comments that it sounds like maybe we have some circular logic saying that criteria for bioretention and feasibility also makes subsurface infiltration feasible. So as it's written, is there any scenario where subsurface infiltration would be acceptable? Um, 
I'm not sure I'd have to read that again more closely. Um, and then one more question from contact that there's many projects greater than 22,000 square feet where full retention of the design storm is infeasible in areas without offset options. These projects will become undevelopable, undevelopable without changes to the retention standard. Is that the intent? And then what level of site controls are required of pursuing offsite mitigation? So I think at a minimum, if you're pursuing offsite, you have to treat The, this flow criteria, but then the retention or the peak flow could be treated at the offsite site. Um, so let's see, now that I've spent some time kind of trying to answer the questions from the TMDLs and the main permit, uh, I think I'm going to pass it off to Leo to discuss some of the trash questions. Uh, Let's see, are you on the line, Leo? Yeah, I'm here. All right, thanks. Uh, do you have any, uh, did we get some trash questions to answer? Yeah, there's a, a couple here, so hopefully it doesn't take <clears throat> too long. Um, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> first question we got from uh, <clears throat> Schaaf and Wheeler, Consulting Civil Engineers, was to do with the use of the rational method to determining, determining one year, one hour peak flow. And they indicate that, <clears throat> that the rational method does not always apply to large watersheds. And that can make that can make create an over design necessary over design and, and make large capture infeasible, and so they're uh, they're asking if the permit can include as an alternative methods of device sizing such as a hydrograph or pipe routing. Um, that, that's a good comment. Um, we we do for multi benefit treatment systems. This, key, this subject came up, we sort of had a committee that helped us put the design criteria together for that. And it was pointed out that that very large areas, um, it would create a, a, a very significant over design of the full capture device uh, because the, <clears throat> the, the one year, one hour peak flow would be uh, significantly less when using the rational equation than if you used Uh, 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 other uh, um, <clears throat> hydro hydromathematical uh, ways of doing it. So we do have something <clears throat> in the uh, multi-benefit fact sheets where we say for large drainage areas, generally more than 50 acres or more, other accept accepted hydro hydrologic mathematical methods that more accurately calculate peak flow rates from large drainage areas is, is acceptable. Uh, so that's a good comment. Uh, we will take that back, and and uh, I, I'm not going to. We, we can't promise any changes today, as you know. But we'll take that back and and look at that to see whether or not we can include uh, something like that. But generally, you know, for the multi-benefit systems, they are large, and so they. I think that's why that came up. Most full capture devices aren't designed for very large drainage areas, but There are some exceptions. These hydrodynamic separators, for instance, they they are designed for very large areas, and so, so there are some exceptions. And so that's something we need to uh, think about. If um, if if we don't change it, then certainly when you give us our your com your formal comments on the next draft, then perhaps you can probably provide some more detail. Maybe give us an example of why it's substantially. A burden, uh, you know, a big burden to calculate it using um, the method that's in the trash provisions, um, and, and how that would impact and be a significant impact as far as costs and expense and so on and so forth. Uh, so anyway, good. Uh, that's a good good question. Um, the other question we got 
was from the city of Lathrop, and they are asking for clarification about section H7 and H8, if it applies to both track one and track two permittees. Uh, previously, they were only applicable to track two permittees. Um, section seven and eight, so just so everyone knows, seven is, section seven deals with the tr uh, trash generation map. Um, and that might be a bit misnamed, misnamed but basically, under the 13383 orders that were issued in 2017, uh, both um, traditional, non traditional, track one, track two, everyone had to furnish a map. <clears throat> the, the requirements were a little bit different, uh, but everyone had to do a map. Uh, and so now in the in section H7 of the draft permit, those mapping requirements are a little more comprehensive than what was in the 13383 order. But as Nick sort of mentioned in his presentation, uh, they were they're made more comprehensive because this is one of the few documents that permittees are required to, to submit in order for the regional boards and interested the public to get a snapshot of what of what a permittee is where that permittee is and complying. Uh, so then the other part of your question uh, about whether section H8, which is the trash, which is the uh, trash assessment plan, uh, you may have caught in your comment, maybe a little a typo or re a drafting mistake that we made because I'm looking at it and the tra trash assessment is only required for track two, whether you're traditional or, or non-traditional. If you're if you're uh, track one, uh, and you, which means you're putting full capture devices at all locations uh, that generate well, either either if you're traditional at priority land use areas or if you're non-traditional at all areas that generate si significant trash, then trash assessments really aren't applicable. So there may be a drafting error there. So I thank you for pointing that out. We'll have to take that back and, and take a look at that and, and make sure that uh, we're accurately telling you what you need to do. So, um, and that's all that came in. And and, and so both the, the, both the people that uh, submitted those comments, I'm, I'm very open if you want to discuss it uh, call me up or, or send me an email to discuss further. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I think all that in, our our info our contact information was on the, either the last slide or was on the first slide. I can't remember. But <laughs> anyway, so that's it. Uh, on the flora. Yes, thank you. Um, so we did get a couple of questions regarding ASBS uh, from Sean Bothwell from California Coastkeeper Alliance. So thank you so much for the questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, the first question is the attachment doesn't require new sampling or monitoring if the permittee has implemented its ASBS compliance plan under previous permit. Who can determine whether existing compliance plans have been implemented? Um, See, so the regional water uh, board would look at the permittees plan versus the permits and determine from there if there's a violation of the permits. Um, next question is how are priority discharge locations determined? Priority discharge locations are um, areas that pose the greatest threat to water quality and are identified to require installation of structural BMPs. Um, let's see, next question is regarding attachment F, section F3, paragraph 15. It asks, um, it says, requires permittees to include strategy to ensure permittees discharges to areas listed in the table. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the question now. Uh, required under section F3, item five above in this attachment or in areas where future alterations of natural ocean water quality are detected 
do not cause or contribute to alterations. So question, how will future alterations of natural ocean water quality be detected and reported? Um, so this is a great question, but unfortunately I can't answer it right now. We need to go back and discuss this with um, uh, our unit. Uh, so uh, we will hopefully come back with a better clarification of that. Um, next question, what monitoring requirements does the permit include to verify compliance with sections 5.2.1 and 5.2.2, uh, which provide that discharges composed of stormwater runoff or authorized non-stormwater discharges, respectively, shall not alter natural ocean water quality in an ASBS. So if the permittee has not completed its monitoring due to say drought or other conditions, then the permittee must complete its monitoring. Hope that's clear. Uh, so last question here in draft attachment F, section F.8. Should the metals in the natural ocean water quality values at reference area monitoring sites be expressed in micrograms per liter versus milligrams per liter? Um, yes, you're correct. Uh, thank you for bringing this to our attention. That was site typo on our end and uh, corrections will be made. Um, so that's all the questions we have for ASBS at this moment. Um, I'll pass this back to Paul. If there are any other questions, please continue, please continue sending it our way. Thank you. Thanks, Flora. Um, okay, so now I'll kind of attempt to go back and answer more questions we have about the sort of main part of the permit. Uh, we got one question from Marin County about outfall monitoring, and I think that's the dry weather flow monitoring. He said the phase one permits dropped the outfall monitoring from their permits long ago because it was shown that it takes a massive amount of staff time and didn't lead to finding illicit discharges. Um, after 11 years of doing them for the phase two permit, we found them to likewise be completely cost ineffective for identifying illicit discharges. Um, what's the reason for keeping this section in? Um, if anything, this requirement should be dropped and visual priority area monitoring should be left in that at least helps identify real-time illicit discharges during dry weather flow monitoring. Uh, this would also cover priority commercial areas and remove the need to expand a costly business inspection program. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm think i pretty sure I agree. I, I like this comment because um, I, I guess I thought that the dry weather flow monitoring was only something you would do during your initial outfall inspection, or if it's just observed while you're otherwise out doing some other kind of inspection. So I guess are people actually going out and like checking their outfalls for dry weather flows every year, or I guess I'm not really sure how that is implemented or works under the existing permit. But yeah, I do agree that maybe there's some kind of like middle ground here between the full inspection program and maybe having some kind of enhanced uh, priority area monitoring. It just seemed like the way the priority, priority area monitoring or assessment was in the existing permit seemed kind of a little too high level and vague, but yeah, so maybe there's some way that that's in between like an improvement of that, but that's maybe not quite to the full level of inspections. Um, we would definitely be interested in more kind of comments and ideas regarding that. Um, and kind of on a similar topic, uh, and again, more comments from Marin County, uh, that these additions to the business inspection list, there are a couple that uh, would add half a dozen or more full-time inspectors for non-priority businesses and include a massive amount of time inventorying all of the businesses annually. And he specifically notes the pet grooming and supply businesses, um, that those are indoor activities, um, maybe not totally relevant to stormwater discharges. Um, strip malls, he says, are not defined and not a business type, and it's more of an area. which may or may not be a priority area, depending on the size and location. 
and that any businesses in a strip mall that are of concern would already be covered by elsewhere on this list. Uh, and that trash in the area would be covered under the trash requirements. And that these type of businesses, commercial businesses as a strip, strip mall wouldn't be covered by inspections by current inspecting agencies. And then he also notes that the other commercial businesses at the end of the list is an open blanket term for all commercial business. And that really kind of leaves it too open-ended. Um, yeah, that could mean thousands of additional commercial businesses not inspected by current inspecting agencies. Um, so those, that's, uh, those are all good points and noted comments. Um, and yeah, again, I kind of like how this one also includes sort of mention of the priority area, um, existing priority area inspections. And yeah, would be interested in more feedback on some kind of like in between or other sort of method to satis satisfy the, uh, that, but, um, we've also got, I'm not going to read each one, but we've got like several um, comments about the sort of timing of everything in the permit and that the timelines are too fast or un unrealistic. Um, we did try to kind of, uh, you know, space things out somewhat, but uh, yeah, maybe there are certain items that could be pushed back somewhat in the permit or to, or different for new permittees versus existing permittees. I think there were some items where it, as we were writing, it kind of felt like they were um, going to be more of an edit or an addition to like something that already existed. So in those cases, it was hard to decide how much extra time was needed. But yeah, then as the editing of the permit goes on, you know, some of those maybe, maybe got edited more than when we initially set the expected timeline. So I guess the timelines could potentially use another uh, look based on some of these comments. Um, also concern regarding the number of deliverables uh, either in a whole year or throughout the entire permit term. So it does seem like maybe we need to have a more thorough kind of list of deliverables and a deeper consideration of kind of how how those are asked for and when they're due. Um, also specifically regarding non-traditionals, which are kind of being asked to do a lot of things that aren't maybe seem not new to us because they're not new for traditionals, but that's a totally completely new thing for non-traditionals. Um, we also had uh, someone asking if we could have a whole kind of separate meeting or workshop or discussions just to hear more concerns from non-traditional specifically. Um, and I'll have to see, I don't know, that does seem like a, um, that does seem like a good idea. I mean, non-traditionals, they cover a lot of different situations and yeah, on the one hand, it's like, sometimes you, you know, we put a requirement in there and it's kind of to catch maybe a not catch, but to cover situations that are kind of edge cases and kind of assume some of them would not be applicable to a, a lot of non-traditionals, but we wanted to sort of cover the ones that it would be, but yeah, maybe some of those end up being more applicable to different, to more non-traditionals than we kind of thought. Um, also kind of a couple different questions and comments regarding whether the state board has identified funding sources to assist with some of these new or increased requirements specifically for inspections and for the asset management. And I can't say that the state water board has identified specific new funding sources for any of the requirements in the permit.
Um, let's see. We had a question about uh, from the Coast Keepers about TMDLs and demonstration of uh, waste load allocation compliance, subsection G. What is an example of other factors to be used in demonstration of compliance? Uh, and can we give an example of a TMDL? Um, so I think other factors, examples are safety concerns and conflicting local permits. I'm actually not sure if I under understand this uh, question. Um, so it looks like we cover other factors in section G3, other factors affecting project implementation. Um, yeah, so other factors such as safety concerns and conflicting local permits that may affect TMDL compliance project implementation. Um, and those factors get included in the project implementation in its annual report. See, we had one question from UC Berkeley about uh, linear underground and overhead projects or LUPs and regarding their post-construction requirements. So the comment states that the 2022 construction general permit states that linear underground and overhead projects are not subject to post-construction requirements due to the nature of their construction to return project sites to pre-construction conditions. And then they ask, it appears that for non-traditionals, and I think it's the same for traditionals, the linear underground overhead projects greater than 5,000 square feet are subject to post-construction if associated with another regulated project. Um, for example, a non-traditional couldn't consider the regulated project portion for post-construction requirements on its own and the linear underground overhead project for its own post-construction requirement. So it sounds like this is a regulated project that has a associated linear underground overhead project. Um, I guess it kind of depends. It, I think this does kind of sound like a situation that I think we would all want it to be considered as one together. I guess I would need kind of more specifics on the uh, exact project. Um, and also, I mean, I think it sounds like the construction general permit is kind of like differs from us on these because, because, uh, I do think that the linear underground overhead projects were included in some capacity in the existing permit. So I, I think they're already covered in the, uh, in the current phase two permit. Uh, so let's see, we, we have some questions from Marin County about the post-construction requirements. Why restrict or disincentivize runoff reduction measures, formerly site design measures, uh, for example, by limiting the size of a roof area that can be sent to a single vegetated area uh, or limiting the length of vegetated area receiving flow? Um, and uh, I guess, could you... I'd have to kind of revisit what the requirements for that one are, but is that one that could be kind of maybe split into two kind of runoff reduction measures, even if it's at the same site? Um, I mean, some of the sort of parameters we put on there were taken from 
kind of like uh, guidelines that the current uh, post-construction calculator sort of referenced. Um, So yeah, I, I guess it, I could see how, you know, li just limiting the size of the roof that can go to one vegetated area could maybe depend on the um, exact specifications of the vegetated area it's draining to. Um, then we have a question of what are the treatment versus retention requirements difference for regulated projects that are under versus over 22,000 square feet of new replaced impervious surface? Um, so I think if you're over 22,000 square feet, then you have to go with the retention requirements. And then it's kind of assumed, I think, that those cover the treatment requirements. Uh, and then let's see, another comment from uh, Marin County is with retention standards in the informal draft, current LID bioretention sizing factors would have to increase by more than four times over current guidance. Uh, this would raise infeasibility of new and redevelopment projects. Did we consider underlying soils in developing these requirements? For example, there are sites that would not currently retain the 85th percentile storm under pre-development conditions. So why would they be required to after development? I don't know if I had thought about it that way. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but definitely we'll be considering that further and uh, taking that back for discussion. And then for interceptor tree credit is the intent to grant full credit for the mature canopy when the tree is planted as a young tree during development. Um, that's another good question. I mean, I think you would want to give the credit, yeah, for the the mature canopy that you will the tree you eventually will have. Um, okay, from Napa County, we have this comment coming from a phase one background, I can see the purpose of a routine inspection program. The phase ones in the Bay Area uh, municipal regional permit were allowed to step in different facility types based on potential to discharge. Um, for example, restaurants and food service were the first two required inspection types under the municipal regional permit. With all of their new unfunded mandates, it seems it would be reasonable to start smaller agencies with similar, if not reduced from the larger agencies with many more staff. So that's a good point. So, I mean, I, I guess as it's written, it it sort of allows you to, each permit you to prioritize themselves, which ones they wanna inspect first, but then it sort of does still stick you with that 20% per year thing. But yeah, maybe even, Maybe it could even be narrowed down to like in this permit term, starting on like like this comment says, maybe there's a more specific subset of facilities that are more higher priority to get these inspections out. Um, or maybe it would be somehow correlated back to the priority areas that have been identified in the illicit discharge section. So it could be like facilities of more specific types within the priority areas, but yeah, that's definitely something we can, uh, yeah, take the comment back with us and kind of discuss more. Okay, from Truckee, we have, please reconsider the ongoing annual dry weather monitoring requirement. This task is very time consuming, expensive, and has not been effective in identifying illicit discharges. Uh, please focus instead on priority area monitoring. Uh, okay, I think, yeah, this is similar to another comment we had earlier. I think I agree with this comment and um, yeah, I guess I didn't really realize that it was a annual requirement. Yeah, I think I thought my interpretation that was that it was a kind of one time done with the, uh, as the outfall map was made. Um, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't think the intent was to have an annual dry weather monitoring. So I, I agree with that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sandy Matthews asked us why are K to 14. So that's K to 12 and then community college requirements not included in this permit. Um, so, you know, we had been like working for a long time on including public schools and community colleges in the permit. Um, that definitely had been like a long-term uh, goal we were going for, but the, uh, the current draft doesn't, you, I mean, if you see in the informal draft, there's no schools or community colleges. Um, basically we'd had a couple of preliminary drafts before this and just the comments that we'd received, including from the schools themselves, uh, kind of just made it clear that we needed a better understanding of the sort of challenges and opportunities of including schools before designating them. Um, we do encourage schools to kind of like proactively, you know, do, uh, do the right thing with stormwater in their area and do stormwater capture as they can and reduce trash and reduce non stormwater discharges. Um, and we definitely haven't forgotten about schools. We are kind of reassessing like what we can do, um, that will kind of allow schools to partner with the surrounding MS4s and work more collaborative, more collaboratively with the existing MS4s, which was kind of one of our main goals of including schools. Um, so yeah, we're not proposing to include them right now, um, but they're not totally written out for forever necessarily. But I think another thing was that it just, it did become kind of clear that like that was definitely going to make getting the permit out a lot more complex. And we do kind of need to get it out relatively quickly here now that the trash uh, provisions are sort of the timeline and that's going to close eventually. So that's kind of one other thing was that we sort of decided we needed to keep moving forward and um get this out with some of the more trash specifics for everybody that's already an existing permittee. Let's see. So kind of on a topic I, I already sort of touched on, we have um, please consider reevaluating the timeline for asset management. Uh, consider maybe the first five years to develop the inventory. Then the next permit could be conduct the condition assessment and develop the long-term improvement planning. Um, please evaluate the conditions for those phase one permittees and structure the phase two program to take these timelines into consideration. And then they also wanted a rationale for providing the value of equipment over $5,000. And I think that was just to sort of set some kind of like baseline of uh, expensive equipment that could need replacement eventually that we wanted in the long-term financial plan. Um, and yeah, this kind of goes back to just needing to maybe more take into consideration more of the timelines in the permit, uh, which is, Thing that like several comments have touched on. Um, another uh, comment on the uh, illicit discharge inspections from Carpinteria. The expanded inspection requirements create a new burden for small cities who have limited staff and it would take away from the time to conduct other implementation. As many of the inspection requirements are already handled through established inspections by other agencies, 
what is the benefit of including them here? Would the agencies conducting those inspections receive funding through the industrial permit to conduct them? Um, so no, I don't, we don't have any plan for kind of funneling funding from, from that into here. And yeah, I think this is maybe covers, there's some overlap with permittees under the industrial permit, but I think it's also to kind of cover some that aren't uh, covered by that. And yeah, it's true that if some of these inspections are already being done, it almost would just be more of a documentation and kind of communication thing between the agencies to make sure that you're kind of have track of which ones have been visited by these other inspection programs. Um, a question about the post-construction water balance calculator. Is the water board preparing a more reliable and user-friendly water balance calculator that can be used to calculate the proper design and sizing for small project runoff reduction measures? So yeah, I think we were trying to kind of write in to the permit what the amount of like credit you're getting for those is. So um, that could coincide with the new calculator, but I think the idea was that it would be less of a black box that you put kind of these numbers into and the permit would spell out a little more what exact credit you're getting without the need of the separate calculator. Let's see, uh, another comment from City of Carpinteria, this time regarding post-construction uh, requirements. Is there a scientific finding or program analysis that supports these changes? City of Carpinteria has been implementing the Region 3 requirements since 2013. There have been a notable increase in underground storage devices, or USDs, for all projects over a certain size. There are several challenges that have arisen related to the retention requirements um including risk of abandoning the in-place underground storage devices leaving a large amount of plastic buried underground long-term maintenance uh, so even though there's a requirement for these to be maintained on an annual basis the funding constraints for property owners could delay this for some years there's issues with geologic conditions Carpentry and much of the MS4 has poor soil, and half of the city sits on an impenetrable or impermeable layer between the surface and groundwater basin, making groundwater recharge unlikely. As a developed city, there is limited opportunity for alternative compliance. This results in underground storage facilities that are largely ineffective. And then increased housing requirements make underground storage more likely in the future. And then the suggestion is requiring landscape elements like bioretention facilities, such as with a set landscaping requirement, would create a better long-term solution, one that is supported by prior programs, such as Contra Costa County. Uh, and then from uh, Mary Zapeta at OMNS Engineering, we have a general comment on nomenclature. It would be extremely helpful to maintain the same nomenclature for plans, inventory, et cetera, as required by the current permit, as the names of the plans can be embedded into ordinances, mus municipal code, et cetera. Other items include maps, inventory names. Okay, so, well, like for example, the site design measures change names to runoff reduction measures, although that coincides with potentially a lot of other large changes to the post-construction. But yeah, I guess maybe this relates back to the, possibly the spill control and illicit discharge plan. So yeah, maybe being, I don't know, maybe we'll have to make a list of all the plans that are in there and what, the, what we call the plan and the existing permit and then what we're calling it now. 
and we could assess, yeah, how much name, unnecessary name changing we're doing. Uh, comment from Truckee regarding asset management. This should be focused on priority catch basins or priority areas. Uh, otherwise, this task would take all dry season to complete. It's similar to the old dry weather monitoring task. Uh, an initial inspection to identify the priority inlets catch basin basins, which would be then placed on an annual plan makes sense, but not all of them every year. Okay, so basically they're asking for a more prioritization on which uh, parts of the asset inventory have to be done annually. A uh, question from San Luis Obispo County about community-based social marketing. Can you provide the rationale for why permittees subject to the community-based social marketing requirements cannot be determined during permit development? Is there a reason that permittees need to wait until after adoption to hear from their regional board as to whether or not this element is required? Uh, this delay in learning about a requirement could create significant challenges for workload planning and budgeting. Um, I don't have rationale for why, but that is a good, that, that's a good comment. And yeah, I think that that is something we should be able to provide is a, a list of permittees that are going to be expected to do the community-based social marketing. Um, I don't think it, there is a plan on expanding it beyond the permittees that are currently doing it, but even that, um, we should have a list, probably a list of those. Cause yeah, it's, to me, it's, uh, not exactly clear who, yeah, who falls under that, even under the existing permit. Um, so yeah, there definitely could be some clarification on who the community-based social marketing is going to apply to. So let's see again, not sure if I've answered every single question, but I think as the, the ones I'm scrolling through here, I think I've at least like touched on a topic and they seem kind of like similar to some of the questions I've gone over. Um, Sorry, just kind of scrolling up here, reading through more of the questions. Um, yeah, kind of just some general asking for more rationale about the post-construction requirements. I, I don't know if I have like really a specific answer for that at the right now. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, we're getting pretty close to four here. Um, I think I've I've kind of tried to answer the, the questions as much as I could. I think obviously some of these I really we really just need to take back and do more consideration on. Um, definitely a lot more discussion on the 
post construction, it seems like, and as well as the asset management and the inspections, they the various inspections throughout the permit. But it's kind of sounding like maybe the questions are trailing off now. And I think this maybe is a good time to uh, end the workshop. So even if I didn't exactly read your question, we're, you know, these are all collected. We're, uh, and these are going to be co combined with what we're getting through uh, the process that's outlined in the um, public notice uh, that noticed this meeting. Um, we're going to combine these all with the questions and comments we're going to get at the public workshop on Thursday, which probably some of you on the line are going to come to that one too, I would guess. Um, and yeah, I think probably this informal high level response that we're going to prepare will, you know, probably be able to give you a lot better answer than I'm just giving you here today. Um, but thanks everybody for listening in. Thanks for your questions. Um, we definitely appreciate you looking over the informal draft and taking the time to be on the workshop today. Um, so I guess with that, I'm going to call the meeting to a close and, uh, again, uh, thanks. Goodbye. See some of you on Thursday and, uh, don't forget to potentially join that, uh, gov delivery mailing list that's on our website. Um, I guess until four, I'm just going to leave this slide up, um, so people can see the email to keep submitting questions, but, um, I think we're going to mostly sign off unless we get a last minute question, but thanks everybody. Bye.